Hear now the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ from the Gospel of John, chapter 1. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture reading continues our journey with Paul in the book of Acts. Let us now hear God's word to us. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout de- per- persons, and also in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Also, some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers debated with him. Some said, what does this pretentious babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign divinities. This was because he was telling them about the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. So they took him and brought him to the Areopagus and said, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting? It sounds rather strange to us, so we would like to know what it means. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners living there would spend their time in nothing but telling and hearing about something new. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely spiritual you are in every way. For as I went through your city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made of human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all the peoples to inhabit inhabit the whole earth, And he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live so that they would search for God and perhaps fumble about and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The week before last, I was in Montreat for ARW, Arts, Worship, and Recreation. It was my first time at this particular conference, though many of the others who were there have been going for years or even decades. I've had a number of friends recommend it in the past, but to be honest, I always thought it was more for youth leaders. Recreation, energizers, games. And to be honest, I wasn't completely disabused of my prejudices. Our opening event was billed as an opening event and worship on the conference's app calendar. There were two ways to enter Upper Anderson, one entrance for those who were ready to dive in, and the other entrance for those of us who preferred the ease-in approach. We chose that door. (laughs) Expecting worship, I was a little surprised to find raucous activity all around and not a chair in sight. The week's theme was dive deeper, but I felt like a fish out of water. 
so much noise, so much energy, so much chaos, and so many energizers. <laughs> For those who aren't familiar, an energizer is a choreographed dance set to music, and they are a mainstay of youth conferences everywhere, I'm pretty sure. Energizers can help wake up a crowd better than coffee, and they can get us out of ourselves. Something that's especially important for youth or college students who tend to bring more of their self-consciousness to these events. The energizers put everyone in the same boat and then shove it out into the waves, <laughs> sometimes literally doing the wave. But I can appreciate them for that extent. I am a big fan of conferences. They offer the opportunity for us to step away from our daily routines, to immerse ourselves daily in worship and reflection, and they can be real mountaintop experiences. I don't think it's any coincidence that many conference centers are located in the mountains, like Montreat. There are a ton of them in the Asheville area, and then of course we've got Massanetta Springs right here in our backyard. Middle school, high school, and college conferences are all geared to their audiences, and energizers abound. Secular music blends with church music, speakers dress comfortably, and preachers never wear robes. The whole experience, including worship, caters to the target audience, and quite effectively. Though I've sometimes wondered how included in the worship audience young people feel when they return to their home churches. You've got to know your audience. That's true. And it's also usually what I've heard described as the message of our reading from today. That Paul tailors his evangelism to meet the Athenians where they're at. The Athenians loved theological and philosophical discourse. And Paul was a scholar perfectly capable of entering into these headier conversations, which is what he does here. But to be honest, now that's not how I've ever read or heard this passage. At this point in Acts, Paul has been jumping between the frying pan and the fire and back and forth again. He has been stoned and arrested and left for dead and beaten and chased out of a few different towns. And now he finds himself alone in Athens, waiting for Timothy and Silas to rejoin him. This is unlike most of Paul's ministry. He always did his ministry in pairs at least, but here he's alone, and he seems to be angry. And the people actually want to hear from him. They even look forward to hearing more. He tries to reason and meet them where they're at, kind of, but I actually think that this might be one of the least effective things that we see Paul do. A few come to believe in Jesus and join him, but it doesn't seem to me to be a rousing success. Paul was more educated than most people in his day and age. He could hang with the big thinkers, and there's nothing that's really wrong with any of his arguments, but to me, they've always felt a little bit empty. When I was in college, I was a philosophy major with a minor in religious studies, and I could also hang with the big thinkers. I even won the philosophy award when I graduated. I was on my own journey of faith, which at that point was really more doubt and deconstruction than anything else. But I really wasn't interested in the philosophy of religion because I didn't care about trying to prove God's existence through rational arguments. Maybe some would be converted by that, but to me, that just missed the essence of faith. And maybe I'm being too hard on Paul, but to me, he looks a little bit like a fish out of water, trying to make something fit that doesn't really fit. The people welcomed his rational discourse. They were hungry for it, but the whole point of following Jesus is that it changes your life, not just your mind. The response he, read, he hears from some, which is, we will hear from you again about this, underscores that disconnect. 
It's an intellectual curiosity that's been sparked. And that's not nothing, but it's not exactly life-changing either. At least not yet. The worship on Friday morning at ARW began with not just the regular two, but three energizers. <laughs> we had to get the favorites in. But once we settled back into our chairs, there was silence. The preacher stepped back, and her words were projected on the screen behind her. And the silence and the message of those words, that was precisely what I needed to hear. I was no longer out of, a fish out of water. I was now swimming silently in a school of waterlogged to near drowning church folk. Paul may have had the chops or the gills to navigate these intellectual waters in Athens, but he was still a church, uh, fish out of water. He didn't fit in that crowd anymore. He had changed. His life had been changed by God. When Paul and Silas found themselves in prison, they didn't try to argue their way out. They sang and they prayed. And later, when Paul was arrested in Jerusalem and brought to trial, he didn't try to reason through his defense. He told them about how he had been on the road to Damascus ready to arrest and bring to trial any of the followers of Jesus when God stopped him in his tracks with a blinding light. We are a congregation that values learning in a similarly inclined denomination. And I'm glad that we do. All of that is part of our faith development. But when it comes right down to it, Christianity is not primarily an intellectual exercise. I hope that sermons and nurture classes give you something to think about, but I hope even more that they give you something to wrestle with, something that engages your whole being and doesn't leave you the same as you were before, something like an energizer maybe. The good news is that it's really God who meets us where we're at. Jesus, who became human to enter into the struggle with us, and the Holy Spirit, who continues to surround us in those times of struggle and triumph. It might not have been Paul's best ministry moment, but there are still people who came to believe in Jesus through it because of Paul's time in Athens. I don't think it had a whole lot to do with Paul's arguments, but everything to do with God's power to reach us, to call us into life-changing relationship with Jesus. We don't have to be all things to all people. We don't have to prove God's existence. In a disenchanted and disinterested world, we just need to live into the transformation that we've experienced in God through Jesus Christ. The witness is personal. How we've been changed, or how we've been challenged to change the world around us because of Jesus. We can speak from our own need because we all have it, and we can speak to the needs of the world and we're not going to run out of those anytime soon. But most importantly, we speak and live out our witness to a God who changes lives, and through those changed lives, changes the world. It's also okay if we fail, or if we think we fail. We can learn from our experiences. God's faithfulness persists beyond our failures. Thanks be to God. God can even use those failures to transform us and transform others. So if we show up to meet others where we are at, then God will be there. If we live authentically as followers of Jesus Christ, that witness will make a difference. 
The Holy Spirit can transform others just as she has transformed us. May it be so. Amen.